Okay, as it is 12, and I said that I'm mm -hmm. going to be on time, uh, I just want to uh, say that we are live streamed and that we are going to be recorded. So this talk is going to be available also after it's been happening. Um, and uh, I will start, even though probably people are going to join us while I do the present, this short presentation at the very beginning. So let me say that it is my great honor to welcome you all uh, to the first virtual meeting organized by our uh, GenPol CEE or GenPol CE network. We chose this particular day also to mark the upcoming International Day of Women and Girls in Science, which is going to take place tomorrow. But as it's Saturday, we thought it would be better to meet on Friday. So since this is the first uh, webinar of the newly established Genpol CE network, allow me to say a couple of words about us. Genpol CE stands for Gender and Politics Re Research Network in Southeast Europe. Though for a moment, we are covering only the region of Western Balkans plus Croatia plus Slovenia with a hope to grow. We met in Belgrade in November after a year of planning and devising ways how to gather people from the region who work with concepts of gender and politics. Not many, but also, as it turned out, not few. The idea of the network was a good and a needed one, and I'm also using this opportunity to express our thanks to Heinrich Böll Stiftung Global Unit for Feminism and Gender Democracy for facilitating its establishing. So although there were people who, and please bear with me, <laughs> uh, there were already people who worked with one another for some time. Many of us met there and then in Belgrade for the first time, seeing that we share certain interests and are in need of recognition as a region. But how better to get this recognition if not through a joint effort and nothing about us without us as the saying goes. What we also learned at the convention in Belgrade is that we, at least at the moment, have two basic strands of interest. One is related to the representation or the quote unquote classical issue in gender and politics domain. And the other, the one that we will be dealing with today, is about anti-gender mobilizations. Ultimately, we realized that we need to be able to think both topics together and see if and how they can be and are related. So today we will be, as you all know, talking about backlash on gender equality in three countries that form the very heart of the Balkans, Serbia, Bulgaria, and North Macedonia. And I will now very briefly uh, introduce our speakers. Um, first, uh, and this is the, the, the order that they will be also speaking to us, is Irena Zvetkovic, who is a gender studies scholar, the executive director of the Coalitia Margini Coalition Sexual and Health Rights of Marginalized Communities based in Skopje, North Macedonia, and the author of a book, uh, I will say it in, in English, and Irena can also then say it in Macedonian if she, if she wants, Who's Afraid of Gender? Uh, in which she analyzed the current anti-gender mobilization in North Macedonia. And the book was fresh out of print when we last met in November in Belgrade. Gergana Nenova comes from Sofia University Sveti Kliment Ohritsky, where she works as a lecturer and researcher at the Depart for Department of Sociology, mainly in the field of sociology and gender studies, focusing especially on sociology of family, childhood and gender in Bulgaria. Gergana Nenova is also an important member of an exciting project on the narratives of return, the main discursive tool of anti-gender mobilization in the post-socialist East of Europe. Last but far from the least, Katarina Loncharevic is Associate Professor of Gender Studies at the Faculty of Political Science, University of Belgrade, and the Editor-in-Chief of the feminist theory journal Genero. And her book on feminist epistemology, please allow me to say this, first of a kind in Serbian language, was only recently awarded with Angel Milic Prize. So I'm very grateful to all of you for being with us today. And I'm happy we will have this opportunity to actively learn from one another and foster further cooperation. Um, I would ask uh, for patience for uh, our big audience. Thank you for coming and being with us today. 
So I would give uh, the word to Irena, then Gergana, then Katarina. And after that, uh, I hope we'll have time and space for a fruitful discussion. Irena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adriana, so much for the invitation. And I'm really glad to be part of this first webinar. Just to ask if everything is okay with the screen. Because I cannot see you. It's, it's everything's fine. Cool. Okay, so thank you also for the uh, introduction. Uh, as Adriana said, I am a part of Coalition Margins. It's a civil society organization based in uh, Skopje. And for the last two or three years, I am leading the program that is related to creating a response to the anti-gender movement. And <clears throat> in, I will share some, uh, I will share what is happening in North Macedonia <coughs> to presenting, uh, through presenting some of the key results from our research. But also, uh, I chose uh, only half of the research since I think the, I think maybe the topics of uh, education, family, etc., will be tackled by other participants. So uh, let me just give you a short uh, history how we started to deal to deal with or think about the anti-gender movement. They showed up as uh, as in some organized form. I think in 2020s, uh, 2020 year. Prior to that, as you can see from the photos here, uh, when we researched, we found that some arguments related to the anti-gender movement, like, uh, uh, like uh, I don't know, fighting against gender ideology, etc., were used in Macedonian context, but they were, I think, under the radar. We had, we haven't had the name. Of, of this, we didn't know what the anti-gender movement really is. So uh, we just perceived it as, I don't know, so we didn't even know how, wh who are these people and what are they doing until the government announced a robust educational reform that included introduction of gender sensitive education and comprehensive sexuality education uh, in Skopje. And this is where uh, the anti-gender groups started showing up as formal organizations, as informal groups, uh, or sometimes even as registered civil society uh, organizations. Uh, very soon after that, um, they opened their social media uh, pages, groups, accounts, etc., and started not only attacking uh, how to say, uh, not, not only attacking some initiatives related to advancing gender equality or, or LGBTIQ rights, but started attacking specific activists like myself and specific organizations like Coalition uh, Margins. And that was the time we've, uh, we said that we have to research these movements. We have to get to know them better to understand their key narratives and strategies in order to create adequate response to this, as I said, new reality for us. So in this research that I have conducted with my colleague Manja Velichkovska, we analyzed 269 texts. So it's articles, images, memes, videos, you name it. Mostly deriving for, from four uh, Facebook sources. And the authors, now uh, majority is unknown because those are posted by the admins of these Facebook groups or pages, and you cannot see who is behind uh, uh, this uh, title admins. But from uh, the authors that are known, majority are men and 8.5% are women. However, what our research uh, and our closely following those organizations showed is that it is not an all male group and that women are important and sig a significant part of uh, such uh, movement. Uh, when we started our research, first, we were very aware that we will distinguish between what is a traditionally conservative part of our society that traditionally has negative attitudes towards women's rights, feminism, queer movement, etc 
and the anti-gender movement. And we relied on uh, important, uh, important books, important literature that has been produced in the recent years related to the anti-gender uh, movement in the world. And we defined that for us, uh, the anti-gender groups or movements is something, as I said, different uh, from the conservative part, because what, uh, what is in the, this narrow definition is that it is an organized voice of saving the world from gender ideology. So they are fighting against gender ideology. And for me and Manya, it was really interested. We were really interested to see how gender ideology is defined in Macedonian context. We, uh, we were aware that it is really a fluid definition. Uh, it really uh, depends on uh, which geographic region is used. And what we find out is that we selected four features of how gender ideology is defined by the anti-gender groups in North Macedonia. And the first, and I think common feature that most of us share in our context is, is the binary opposition of nature versus nurture applied in the dynamics between sex and gender. So you already know sex is perceived as something natural and uh, gender and gender identity is perceived as something artificial, socially constructed, but with a certain goal. And this is really important. The next feature um, with, uh, we, we distinguished is uh, the binary opposition of science versus theory, usually described through attacks on gender studies taken by the, as I said, Macedonian anti-gender uh, groups. So in their, uh, in their uh, perception, the only scientific discipline that should be interested in masculinity and femininity is biology. And gender studies are, uh, it's not a scientific field, it's not a scientific discipline, but rather an ideological, uh, ideological construct for brainwashing population and of course because we were following only the Macedonian uh, groups it was it is perceived as something that is posed by left-wing government in order to brainwash the pure Macedonian people the third feature was the undefeatable force of sex or perceiving sex as the only uh, natural reality of people usually uh, described through uh, texts that are dealing with, with the transitioning of certain amount of the transgender community. So they will focus only on cases of detransitioning, finding such people around the world and presenting them in Macedonian context. Uh, what they do with this is again to, uh, uh, to, 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 prove, to prove that Sex is something that you cannot change. Sex is something that is undefeatable. It is almost like a destiny you're born uh, with. The other part of the transgender community that didn't go through, through this detransitioning are labor, labeled, of course, as delusional people or people with serious mental health problems. And the fourth feature, which was, which was very uh, important for us, is that such uh, discourse, such discussions are immediately translated into our realities through changes of the laws, policies, uh, etc. So they have uh, they have uh, secured their presence in Macedonian institutions, in Macedonian parliament, and we see that uh, in the short time that they are here, they managed to have two very big victories. Uh, as I said, the stopping of the educational reform and revoking of the law on legal gender recognition from the Macedonian parliament. The photos you're seeing uh, on your screen is taken the previous year uh, in October when the first live uh, event of such groups happened in Strumica. Uh, the event um, uh, had the title of uh, how to fight against gender ideology or what is gender ideology. And you can, I don't know if you can see it's very dark, it's their photos, I wasn't invited there. 
but um, uh, it is full of audience. It is, I mean, you cannot imagine doing so, any kind of event instruments and gather 400 people in one place. Uh, politicians from the opposition and position were there. And the speakers are a priest, uh, a doctor from the public health institution dealing with mental health of kids, and university professor from the faculty, from the biggest university in North Macedonia, Faculty of Philosophy. Um, uh, just let me get back to their uh, legal initiatives. The, when they uh, mobilized to revoke the law that was almost uh, adopted in Macedonian parliament, that should have regulated the procedure for legal gender recognition of transgender people, because of this, I mean, it, it, it wasn't a big fight. They, they won us in two days. But uh, this is when this happened, is that uh, different anti-gender groups gathered together uh, in uh, one coalition called Coalition for Protection of Children. Back then when I was doing this um, presentation, it was the 26 of them. Now they are 28. And they are their main partner is Family Watch International, and then supported by Genit, which is which is Gender Identity Challenge Scandinavia Institute. And uh, as I said, uh, I just opened the, their website. They have two more supporters, and they are part of uh, now they have a Balkan network, which is administrated in Bulgaria. So maybe Gergana knows more uh, more on this. And then we ask. Uh, uh, we ask ourselves uh, why, as I said, in a very short period of time, they have successfully uh, uh, attract a lot of people. So we try to understand why, what is uh, the trick, what is the trick strategy that makes their uh, rhetorics such and strategies so popular. And um, what the research showed is that the anti-gender discourses are as anywhere structured as populist discourses. I mean, this dynamic um, between um, uh, the people and the elite is prescribed as the dynamic between the majority of this gender normal, natural people, uh, which are represented by the anti-gender movement, supposedly, and on the other side is the corrupt, the morally impure elites that are spreading this gender ideology. We managed to distinguish four discursive characteristics uh, that are uh, that are used in all, actually in almost all of the text we uh, analyzed. Uh, that are the basis of the uh, populist discourses. Of course, one is the, the rotten West, since, since using such discourses uh, relies on depicting who is the enemy and uh, who is the, the victim or who, who is the elite and who is the, the people. So the rotten West is represented through uh, several institutions like the European Union, um, the International Planned Parenthood Association Foundation, et cetera, through pop, um, uh, popular culture, uh, etc. But what they in Macedonia insist, they don't insist that the West or the Western society is rotted as always. They they share this nostalgia of the good old days where when even the West was fine. They are attacking the liberal West, and then once you have the liberal West as the uh, the hostile ideology you must depict the agents ag uh, agents of this ideology within our society. So here, the, as the civil society from North Macedonia is depicted as corrupted elite. We are almost every day on their websites, on their Facebook pages. Um, at least once a week, there is an article that is dealing with us, the Sorosoids, uh, the the foreign agents, etc. And then when you have the corrupted elite, what they what they are doing is they are depicting the people. So who are the people? As you know, the people is something that is also a construct. And the people 
or is depicted as the silent majority, as the normal people who are, uh, most of them are uh, normal men, women, biological men, women that have families or that are planning to have uh, families. But while taking, uh, using this uh, populist discourses to dip deeper into their uh, narratives, we soon find out that the, uh, the idea behind such groups is not really to, um, to question uh, liberal elites, but to pose new elites. And in North Macedonia, these anti-gender groups are very careful when talking about this new elites, they, they very rarely um, uh, talk or speak about political parties or politicians, although they are supported by any of them in Macedonian context. What they do is that they promote international leaders like Putin, Orban, or uh, recently President uh, Vucic. And this is what secures them uh, really easy uh, way of entering inst uh, institutions that are really clo close to many of us. So this is kids from schools that are drawing their logo of this uh, coalition uh, for protection of children. They're every day they're inside uh, different schools talking with kids, giving presents to kids and then kids giving presents to, to them. Uh, I have problem with my, okay. And then if we go back to what I said, uh, the law on legal gender recognition was revoked due to uh, the mobilization of the anti-gender groups, but not only them, they were supported by some women organizations. So we were really interested to see uh, the relations in between, the relation between the anti-gender movement and the feminist or the women uh, organizations. I will just, uh, since I don't have much time, uh, in our research, we depicted four uh, arguments on how they are deepening the, this, the, the division between the feminist and queer movement, but also deepening discord or creating discord within feminist movement and within the queer movement. This, from, uh, this is their main job, to depict trans women as threats to women and children. With this argument, they managed to revoke the law. Um, saying that uh, women and children will never be safe because now women with penises are entering their uh, private spaces, their public toilets and, uh, and their uh, school toilets, etc. Then presenting trans women as usurpers of women merits and status, especially in sport and beauty pageant. And then of course, connect real feminism that is for real women and everything else. Is, um, is for the, uh, these uh, demons in our society. At the end, I usually uh, finish with this pessimistic and optimistic views. And um, yes, they are connected transnationally, but we should never forget that we are also connected as these events proves. They have money and their research on this, yes, they have money. And I know we always, uh, as, especially as civil society, we always struggle for money, but we, at least for now, we have money to deal or to think about these issues. Yes, they are supported by the majority, but uh, let's not forget that we still have very important relationship with important institutions, especially internationals. They use, yes, a lot of fake news and disinformation, and it's hard to fight fake news and disinformation, but what we have on our side is facts and evidence. And I agree that they are united now, but let's not forget that we have a tradition of activism. They are pretty new in this field. At the end, I will finish is I agree that maybe as it seems they are winning, but let us remind, always remind ourselves that we still haven't lost. Many thanks, Irena. It was the, the the last slide was really great, and somehow you know gave gives enthusiasm for a fight further on. Girgana, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Adriana. I will also share my presentation. One moment. Okay. 
Okay, do you see it now? Yes. Uh, so it, it was really interesting to uh, hear Irena um, and, to and I was comparing in my head the situation in Bulgaria and in uh, North Macedonia. Unfortunately, I am not informed about this uh, civil organization which you mentioned, but uh, I will have to check this, I promise. Uh, the way um, the anti-gender mobilization started in Bulgaria is um, by uh, with the protests against the Istanbul Convention in um, the end of 2017, 2018. And here you can see some of the messages around this protest, uh, which is there is no third sex and uh, that the gender convention, which is the Istanbul Convention, is um, a, a form of violence against the normal person, actually. Um, and I have called this first uh, wave of anti-gender mobilization, first anti-gender mobilization, because the second one, as you will see, has some di distinct topics and developments, which I will uh, try to outline. And um, as I already said, um, the first anti-gender mobilization in Bulgaria started with the political and social controversy over the ratification of the Istanbul Convention, uh, which uh, I guess you all know uh, is um, a Convention for Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. And this document was signed uh, previously, but uh, its ratification actually um, was um, the object of a, uh, a debate that uh, started at the end of 2017 and proceeded into 2018 and actually uh, led to the revocation or um, non-ratification of this convention. Uh, and uh, what is specific about this first anti-gender mobilization is that it started from uh, religious, conservative, right-wing NGOs, but also was supported by key political actors, political parties, um, also the president at that time, who is also the current president. And he said that the resistance against the ratification was the victory of the Bulgarian society because the texts in the convention uh, are in opposition to our values, moral traditions and faith. And I think uh, this is very significant because right from the start, we have support from um, these anti-gender mobilizations from uh, key political actors, which are still very um, active. And another key political actor is the Bulgarian Socialist Party, um, who is uh, 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 still opposing the um, a convention and is uh, among the most uh, open opponents of the gender ideology or the socialist party. At this stage, we also heard the opinion of the Orthodox Church, uh, which also influenced the debate. And uh, the man manifestation of the this anti-gender mobilization was um, a public debate uh, around the meaning of gender, uh, which was provoked by the statement of a Bulgarian politician who said that gender means third sex and that the Istanbul Convention is actually introducing third sex in, in Bulgaria, that, that's the aim. And uh, uh, the meaning of gender, uh, the, the meanings of gender which were discussed, uh, and this relates to what Irena said, uh, they all revolved about the question, uh, is gender different from sex? Why do we actually need uh, social uh, meaning of sex when we have the bi biological sex? Uh, does gender actually mean third sex? And in this um, discussion, uh, a lot of journalists, experts, international organizations took part. Um, finally, uh, the political uh, party, which was ruling at that time, decided to uh, ask the uh, Bulgarian Constitutional Court if uh, the, conven the Istanbul Convention was um, um, in alliance with our legislation. 
And uh, what the Bulgarian Constitutional Court uh, uh, did was to declare the convention as unconstitutional. And the grounds uh, for, this, um, um, for this opinion were uh, again rooted in the definition of gender. Because according to, the, to this uh, Bulgarian Constitutional Court, the definition of gender as social construct relativizes the bio biologically determined boundaries between the two sexes, men and women. So we are back to that biological determinism, which we know so well, I think. Um, and uh, the convention is still not ratified. They, there is strong resistance uh, against um, this ratification. Uh, as a result of this uh, position against the Istanbul Conventions, uh, the, the key elements of the anti-gender discourse were formed. Uh, the first one is uh, very similar to what Irena said about the uh, dis discourse around gender ideology. Um, that's the demonization of the West, NGOs, liberalism, LGBT people. Um, is opposed to the Bulgarian nation and its values and morals, like um, that quote from the president actually says. And the second very important element of this uh, anti-gender discourse uh, is actually the narrative of the traditional Bulgarian family, uh, which is um, being endangered by the gender ideology, um, the possible legislation of same-sex marriage, also by the influence of gay people and the topic of sexual education also appeared in this debate. There were several uh, topics which um, were um, part of this anti-gender discourse, but we also have this uh, topic of the danger of educating um, children uh, about sexuality. And uh, it's obvious that uh, homophobia, heteronormativity lie at the center of the anti-gender discourse. Uh, and But uh, I want to uh, underline one last thing about this first anti-gender mobilization, and this is uh, probably uh, its uh, biggest victory, uh, that uh, gender entered everyday language um, in a specific negative me meaning. It was re redefined by, I don't know whom, maybe... Um, many people in general and now gender uh, means gay person liberal person weird person so it's used uh, in a very uh, i would say destructive way <laughs> uh, when it comes to actually uh, understanding uh, what what is gender um, and this everyday use of gender continues till now. Um, and for instance, uh, when my students enroll in the sociology of gender course, they say that they, they never knew that gender had another meaning different than gay person. So it's very well established. And I think that's really a symbolic victory for the anti-gender discourse, which is um, needs to be mentioned. Uh, so the second anti-gender mobilization uh, uh, was um, took place in 2019, 2020, and it was um, based on the resistance against uh, an, a document which is called National Strategy for the Child. And then another document uh, which was a draft for a, uh, for a law, uh, it's called the Social Services Act. Uh, here um, we have we had uh, a really widespread resistance, uh, which was more from coming from um, ordinary citizens, parents, organizations, which were uh, formed especially for this um, opposition. And uh, for instance, the, the logo which I have shown here is uh, of the Facebook group, uh, No to the Strategy for the Child, which had more than 150,000 members. And the protests were really massive. So what is kind of new here, but not, not so new, is that uh, to the narrative of the traditional Bulgarian family in danger, uh, we have 
the child put at the center. And uh, this narrative is strongly reinforced by the image of the child in danger and the idea that the rights of the parents are undermined. Uh, so um, it's this uh, mobilization obviously builds on the first one, but it uh, develops um, its main narrative. Uh, another um, kind of new thing about this the second anti-gender mobilization uh, was that um, uh, except for in NGOs, the West gender ideology, another enemy was introduced into de the debate as their potential ally, and this is the Bulgarian state. Uh, and the, so the main fear of the uh, Bulgarian parents who uh, opposed to this um, document was that their children will be taken away by the Bulgarian state uh, because of um, in order for the uh, Bulgarian state to protect their rights uh, and they will be taken away and given to some Western, probably gay families. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the main argument against the strategy was the rights and uh, that the rights and the authority of the parents are undermined by an increased role of the state, uh, which is increased by um, giving more power to the state with the national strategy for the child. Um, so this um, discursive turn, or it's not so much of a turn, but uh, actually kind of enrichment of the anti-gender uh, this uh, course is um, deeply rooted in the distrust toward public institutions in Bulgaria. And that's why um, it was so successful. Uh, as uh, was the case of the Istanbul Convention and the documents Irena mentioned, um, both these, um, both of these documents, National Strategy for the Child and the Social Services Act, actually were not approved because of the public resistance, and um, uh, they, the debate uh, prevented some um, the introduction of some. Um, important measures with regards to children's rights. Um, so uh, what are the consequences of these anti-gender mobilizations? Where do we stand now uh, in Bulgaria? Uh, the first uh, in, uh, consequence, which is very serious, I think is the reinforcement of already existent homophobic attitudes in the everyday use of gender. Because as I mentioned, now it's um, used in a very negative way as a kind of insult when you want, when somebody wants to address a person with, which is, um, who is not gay, but uh, it, it's it, uh, it, it's used as an insult in everyday language. Uh, the second uh, consequence uh, is related to the stabilization of anti-gender, anti-European Union, anti-Western rhetorics, uh, which are which are supported and reinforced by key political actors. And um, it is still so that the anti-gender discourse is used as a powerful, powerful resource by nationalist, pro-Russian parties, organizations, also by the Bulgarian Socialist Party. Um, and this has consequences for the rights of women in, as well, because um, changes in the law for violence against women, uh, which were proposed uh, very recently and had to improve the situation of the victims of the domestic uh, violence were blocked by political parties uh, like led by the Bulgarian Socialist Party, but not only because that was the majority of the members of our parliament. Um, and this, um, these changes in the law for violence against women were um, revoked because uh, of the risks associated with the gender ideology. So in the in our parliament, we had, that was actually two weeks ago, a very heated political controversy where we uh, heard again these same arguments about the threat of gender ideolo ideology, sexual education, 
uh, threats that are directed mainly to towards our children and um, who are in danger of um, from influence from the um, bad West. Um, so, uh, and, and finally, I would say that uh, the continuing influence of anti-gender discourse led to a growing social and political polarization along the lines of pro-West, contra-West arguments. And this polarization is obvious in all kinds of cases. Probably the most recent one is the introduction of the Euro in Bulgaria, uh, but um, also we have other topics that are still related to our position in the European Union. Uh, I should also say, and that's my opinion, that the COVID measures actually um, made this uh, polarization in the society and in politics um, stronger uh, because um, a lot of people opposed these measures and that um, kind of connected with the uh, anti-gender, anti-West, anti-EU rhetorics. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as uh, with Irena, my main concern in this presentation, one of my main concerns is why did this happen? And uh, from the literature uh, on gen anti-gender movements, we know a lot about the global factors behind, the, um, behind them, but um, I was more interested into the local factors for the anti-gender mobilizations. And uh, I have uh, used a very uh, unprecise distinction between political factors and cultural factors, but uh, I, it's uh, a bit artificial, but it helps for me. <laughs> to understand why uh, we, we had that happened in Bulgaria. Uh, among the political factors behind the anti-gender mobilizations, um, I would mention the prolonged um, ruling of a pro-European uh, popul populist party uh, between, uh, that's almost eight, eight years. Um, the government was dominated by this party Mm, which actually introduced a lot of um, you, uh, you, uh, policies of the European Union and legislation, but also uh, had a very populist uh, approach to introducing them, which according to some uh, scientists led to the maintenance of a culture of imitation, uh, which meant that the actual implementation of these policies was um, a bit problematic and uh, it was more about uh, imitating these policies. And uh, a second political factor is the political instability in our country, because since 2018, we have widespread protests against um, this one party, uh, GERP, which um, was in the government. Uh, we have ongoing political crisis, and in 2023, now we are heading towards our fourth parliamentary elections for the last uh, two years. And this political instability is um, a very good climate for the uh, proliferation of these anti-gender discourses. We also have this um, conservative or orientation of the Bulgarian Socialist Party, which is the main opponent of the gender ideology in Bulgarian, um, the stable presence of nationalist political parties in the parliament as well. Um, I will also mention one last thing, uh, which concerns, uh, concerns the gender equality politics in Bulgaria. Uh, as you know, we are members of the European Union since um, 2007, and um, in, we have a law for gender equality since, since 2016. Uh, but um, the, this um, gender equality politics is uh, uh, driven by the European Union and um, uh, is, um, implements the agenda of the European um, Union, uh, which means that there is a heavy focus on gender equality in employment. Um, in all kind, kinds of documents on gender equality in Bulgarian, which I read, uh, I could say that the private sphere is somehow bra bracketed under the work-life balance. Uh, and uh, 
despite data that uh, our country uh, has um, big inequalities, gender inequalities in unpaid work, this is still not an issue in Bulgaria. And also this um, AU-driven gender equality politics uh, ignores completely the cultural dimension. And there is no real politics in terms of changing beliefs, attitudes, and uh, norms concerning gender equality in Bulgaria. Um, and uh, I will uh, say some things about the cultural factors, which I think are um, part of the reasons behind the, uh, the popularity of the anti-gender discourse. I will not speak about religion here because I think that the role of uh, Christian religion has been um, discussed very often. I will be I will focus explicitly on values and attitudes uh, which are important in Bulgarian context and in my opinion they kind of facilitated and made possible these uh, anti-gender mobilizations. Um, here I use uh, some data from um, the European value study and uh, I build on the approach of Ron Ronald Ingelhardt and Pippa Norris in their book, Rising Tides, Gender Equality and Cultural Change Around the World. So um, and as a so sociologist, uh, this is probably the most interesting part for me. How does gender equality relate to our cultural values, attitudes, norms and beliefs that we have? Uh, and uh, this, um, the European value study um, shows, uh, it's a cross-national um, study uh, which um, is done uh, since 1981 till 220, uh, that uh, in Bulgaria we have very traditional attitudes toward the gender roles of women and men. Uh, and I have quoted here some of the results, um, and I have also included um, North Macedonia and Serbia in the stati statistics about the responses given um, about these attitudes. But uh, I sh from all this, maybe I should say that 67% uh, in Bulgaria think that what woman wants most is home and children, um, and that's in 2017. In North Macedonia, 62%, uh, 49% in Serbia as compared to a Western country, which is Germany, like 30%. Um, we also have this uh, crucial- Anna, sorry, can I just ask you to slowly? Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, another question from this uh, European value survey concerns uh, political leadership. And um, uh, the question that um, do men make better political leaders than women um, is answered with yes by 45% of Bulgarians, 36% of people in Serbia and 46% in North Macedonia. So we see here how in terms of values and attitudes, our uh, cultures are really similar. And I think that this is very important and it, it's a good um, way to understand and deal with our own cultures. Uh, another um, so-called, by me, <laughs> cultural factor uh, concerns the attitudes towards people of different sexual orientations. And here I have used uh, data by the, from the European Social Survey, um, which is discussed by Lilia Dimov and Martin Dimov, that uh, this data shows that uh, in Serbia and in Bulgaria, we, I couldn't find data of, of uh, North Macedonia, we have very high intolerance to LGBT people, which is not like anything on in Western Europe. And probably a, a third cultural factor which I would like to mention is um, uh, concerns the attitudes towards violence against women. Uh, it, it's violence against women um, is still uh, considered a personal problem by almost 40% of Bulgarians according to research. 
And um, this partly explains the resistance against the Istanbul Convention because um, it, the Istanbul Convention um, deals with um, violence against women, obviously as a social and political problem. But uh, in Bulgaria, we still have um, a, lot, a lot of people who obviously don't recognize that, that this is a problem. And I think that uh, this data shows that there is um, a lot of work to be done on the level of culture and attitudes and norms, uh, which need to be addressed um, in order to, um, to deal with anti-gender um, discourses and movements and be prepared for what they have to say to us. Uh, uh, another cultural thing, in my opinion, is that we should explore the role of the media. And uh, here I will just mention briefly that violence against women um, sometimes is represented in a very controversial uh, way. Um, there is still some uh, sort of victim blaming in, in media, in social media as well. And um, this requires uh, we, we can't speak about political measures in this case, but uh, our own efforts as um, people who are interested in and engaged in this topic. And I will finish uh, this uh, really short introduction into the anti-gender movements in Bulgaria with some dilemmas uh, which I have identified in my own experience as a researcher of gender equality. Um, about how we should speak and how we should deal with gender equality in our post-socialist context, which is obviously marked by anti-gender discourse and we don't know for how long, so it, it will probably stay. Um, the first dilemma is language. How do we speak about language? What kind of uh, words do we use so that we don't trigger the anti-gender um, response. Uh, and I think that we should be really uh, focused on being speaking based on empirical facts in concrete terms. So that's, of course, is difficult to do, but still, I, I think that it's worth thinking about this. Another key dilemma, I think, is um, it, it also concerns activism, not only research of gender equality. What do we focus on when we speak of gender equality in post-socialist context? Here, my um, opinion is that we should be um, focused on politicizing the private and um, questioning the private public distinctions, which obviously is very problematic in our context because it's very strongly supported uh, and private problems are rarely seen as political. Uh, a fourth point um, is uh, regards uh, sex and sexuality, which are the bull in our cultures. I don't know if that's uh, the same in Serbia and North Macedonia, but definitely in Bulgaria, there is not much research. Uh, there is no open discussions on sexuality. Um, so, and th that's a kind of prerequisite for the strong anti-LGBT attitudes uh, and the uh, anti-gender discourse. And finally, uh, uh, my proposition is that we also think about the intersection of gender with other social categories when we discuss it. So I think it's also very important to keep in mind that gender usually intersects with sexuality, ethnicity, and many, many others. Uh, so that was from Bulgaria, from Sofia. Thank you. Thank you, Birgana. Thank you very much. And I am now calling Katarina to to take the floor. Uh, thank you, Adriana. And thank you, Irene and, and Girgana. I think that we have a lot of, you know, uh, common ground for um, discussion. And as Adriana said, um, I will be very, very focused in uh, my presentation. Uh, and I will deal with the academic community, uh, namely conservative academia, that have been quite active in its resistance against so-called gender ideology in Serbia. 
Um, and um, regarding the key concept, the gender ideology, I will follow Kuhar and Paternod's definition of gender ideology. Um, it's a term that is created against activists for women's and LGBT rights and against research and areas of research that deconstruct essentialist and naturalistic assumptions about gender and sexuality. Kuhar and Paternot also argue that uh, gender ideology offers um, an interpretative framework to oppose ethical social reforms, sexual and reproductive rights, same-sex marriages, adoption of children, new reproductive technologies, sexual education, gender mainstreaming policies, protection from gender-based violence, etc. And all of that, and that is very important for my presentation, is produced through non-contextual and often false referencing and quoting out of the context different authors who loosely belong to the field of research, such as feminist, LGBT, and queer studies. So conservative academia is one of the active participants in discussions against so-called uh, gender ideology, an important actor in creating anti-gender discourses regarding women's and LGBT rights, especially against gender equality law and same-sex pa sex partnership law uh, in 2021. However, the first attack uh, against women's and LGBT rights that frames the recent ones, we can trace back to 2017 and the case of that famous educational packages developed by Incest Trauma Center on the topic of sexual violence against children intended for children in kindergartens, primary and secondary schools. And the aim of these uh, packages was primarily um, to pre uh, pre prevention of different sorts of violence against children. And uh, they also included instructions for teachers, how to approach to different issues such as sexuality of children, wanted or unwanted sexual physical contact, how to give an advice uh, to children in case of sexual gender based violence, and et cetera. And I will not deal with that uh, case because it is very, very well analyzed. Uh, and Adriana actually wrote a couple of articles, both at the academic and for public audience regarding this case. What is important is that um, the packages were introduced in October 2016, but in April 2017, first attacks actually uh, appeared. And the first article against the educational packages was written by the member of academic community, and uh, his attack um, was actually an attempt to analyze the context of the packages. But the second one, was published by another member of the academia, and this time in the oldest newspaper in Serbia, Politica, um, where packages were attacked not because of the content, content because we, we cannot see that the content is analyzed, but because of the author's worry about the demographic situation in Serbia, a negative birth rate, and the fear that the traditional family already in danger is even more vulnerable with these educational packages. And after that, we had uh, of course, uh, the third reaction that is also well explored by, by our research, uh, researchers. So in a couple of days, during the April 2017, we had a couple of articles written, written and published against so-called gender ideology embodied in educational packages developed on the topic of sexual violence against children. And these articles although most of them did not deal with the content of the packages, brought about a general impression in the public sphere that the packages are part of foreign propaganda, LGBT propaganda, and of course, gender ideology, which all together declared the war against traditional Serbian family and family values. And faced with that, the Minister of the Education, after these uh, articles received great uh, public attention, promised some changes in the text of the packages. However, a day after the minister statement, Politica was the place where uh, it was announced the retraction of the educational packages and a new team of experts unnamed, which would write the documents that are more in accordance with, uh, with our needs. So conservative members of the academia use the position of power and the power of influential media, which regularly give them space and visibility to put the pressure on the government to retract the educational packages. So their position is not only position of people of science, 
who scientifically argue against the educational packages. They used both their position of power to present the packages as unsupported by scientific evidence, although that claim was not elaborated at all, and simultaneously on behalf of the people of Serbia. So it is not surprising that highly visible anti-gender scholars, and some of them were active in this initiative against trauma center educational packages, were selected as experts who reviewed biology textbooks for the eighth grade of primary school in 2022. Namely, Ministry of Education, um, under the pressure of conservative political actors, gave an order to the Institute uh, for the Advancement of Education to form um, a working group with the task of reviewing biology textbooks for the eighth grade of primary school, schools because of the content, which includes terms, concepts, and definitions of sex, gender, gender identity, sexual ident identity, and sexuality. And members of the working group were all well, uh, were all well known anti-gender scholars, mainly sociologists, philosophers, political scientists. Not a single member of the working group came from biology, school of medicine, pedagogy, or psychology. This fact is important because the working group decided the following. First, pupils in the eighth grade are not mature enough and capable of reasoning about gender identity. Some of the inter interpretations given in seven of eight analyzed biology textbooks could be ideological, says the team of experts. An emphasis on existence of intersex and transgender persons, as well as persons that are not heterosexual, rep represent incitement, propaganda, and even psychosocial re-engineering of pupils in order to adopt gender identity that is different from their biological sex and non-heterosexual, as they say, patterns of behavior. The working group, however, doesn't, go, doesn't give arguments based on scientific facts. However, the Ministry of Education followed the proposals of the working group and the content of seven textbooks has been changed. There is a very thorough analysis of the proposal of the working group provided by the interdisciplinary team, which included now biologists, medical doctors and professors in social medicine, psychologists, pedagogists, gender studies scholars, and it was an initiative of the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory and its Gender Research Lab. And I believe this in initiative represents an excellent model for our future engagements against anti-gender discourses in Serbia. And the 12 pages uh, analysis is, is available, I believe, on the Institute website. So if people are interested, they can read it. So it is also not surprising that the similar actors involved in the campaign against incest trauma center educational packages and textbooks in, in biology uh, have been highly visible in, public, uh, in the public and media space regarding the drafts of gender equality law, which was adopted in 2021, and the same sex partnership law, which has never been on the schedule of the parliament. And I will focus for the rest of my presentation on conservative academia attacks on same-sex partnership law. Um, the first reaction of the conservative academia was formulated in the form of petition, published first in a conservative magazine named Pechat on March 15, 2021. Professors, intellectuals, members of the Serbian Academy of Science, in total number of 2012, called themselves the Coalition for the natural family, and demanded from the parliament and other institutions the immediate retraction of the drafts of the gender equality law, same-sex partnership law, and new version of the anti-discrimination law. The Coalition for the Natural Family called the same-sex partnership law unnecessary, bad, and conceptualized on the basis of the family law, which represent an obvious step towards same-sex marriages, which would soon lead towards the possibility of adoption of children, the end of quote. The draft of the law is unconstitutional and it would endanger prenatal policies. The Coalition for the Natural Family, however, asks for broad support. So their petition is not only a stance on the part of academia, but they invite, uh, quote, the wider public and traditional and religion communities to react and therefore we will all together defend the right to freedom and future of our people. The second reaction from the conservative academia deserves, I think, thorough analysis. 
the scientific academic journal, Sociological Review, opened the call for papers for the topic on the issue LGBT plus policy sociological review with Slobodan Antonic as a guest editor of the topic of the issue. And Slobodan Antonic was highly active against educational packages by his Institute Trauma Center, Center and a professor of sociology. And he wrote a lot of articles in books in which he argued for anti-feminism and anti-LGBT policies. The topic of the issue was published in volume three of the journal in 2021 under the updated title, Gender, Language and Politics. Guest editor Slobodan Antonic says, Quote, the editorial board of sociolog sociological review firmly supports the freedom of scientific research and through dialogue of different theoretical positions, value, uh, value viewpoints and social policy concepts. We believe that it is the duty of the leading national journal in the field of social and humanistic sciences to open their pages to the abundance and pluralism of our scientific life that is unfortunately uh, often encumbered by non-academic and heteronormous standards uh, of the truth regime and political correctness. As usual among anti-gender discourses, the guest editor claims that the journal will give the space for different perspectives despite the terror of political correctness and gender ideology. However, the topic of the issue does not give the space for the feminist or LGBT scholars, and it is not intended for them. The topic of the issue presents gender, LGBT, and queer studies as suspicious, unscientific, without proper ar arguments, and the whole uh, topic of the issue promotes anti-gender discourses. Two papers are probably the best examples of anti-gender discourses, the paper written by the guest editor himself and the paper written by the editor-in-chief of the Journal uh, of Sociological Review. The guest editor, Slobodan Antonic, writes the paper entitled one theoretical framework for understanding current LGBT issues in Serbia today. Uh, and he deals with discussions around gender equality law and same-sex same partnership law. And he frames the LGBT question in the following way, and I will give you a very, very long now uh, um, quote, something like Mary Wollstonecraft cites uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, because believe me, it is really said like that. Two influential contemporary identity movements, LGBT and feminist, are described as the movement of upper and middle class induced by the transcapitalist system elite. Both of them are based on idealization of atomized sexuality. Both, the, both of them refer to the appetites of the member of upper and high uh, middle class. And both of them are part of the hegemonic narrative matrix of neoliberal capitalism. The production and affirmation of the group gender and sexual identity has the function of suppressing the class conflict, the only one that really jeopardizes the system by subduing the majority of class identities, particularly at lower certification levels. These new important, important ident identities substitute the main line of the system conflict between transcapital elite and hired workers and clerks with the conflict of men versus women, homosexuals versus heterosexuals, progressives versus conservat uh, conservatives. Since this, those split lines divide class strata, now it is naturally harder to reach the articulation of any class interest, let alone class action, trade union, political or social. As a small country on the semi-periphery of the world capitalist system, Serbia is constantly under the pressure of hegemonic structure from the USA and EU to adjust its entire economic, political, and cultural sphere to the dominant normative pattern of the center, particularly the rights of women and LGBT community. These movements, uh, also in Serbia, gather primarily the representatives of upper and middle social strata, who are dominant in the so-called pro-European citizen left wing too. Hence, such systems support the gender ideology, which by separating sexuality from the biological sex and birth, makes an individual essentially insecure, alienated, disoriented, constituted of his own sexuality and, and conflicts with the surroundings from the family to the society nation. An ideal uh, post-identity worker consumer practically must lose every identity, such as class or national ones, except from the sexual identity. And even that identity should be fluid and indefinite so that an individual is uh, reduced to the pansexual no monad, 
would be deprived of any capacity to, to observe the malice of the system and put up resistance against it. So this is, you know, from different parts of his uh, uh, paper, what he actually has to say about this, you know, LGBT frame. Here we uh, see something that is not new in formulation of anti-gender discourses and already explored by different authors. First, women's and LGBT rights are imports. Second, they are part of trans-capitalist elite efforts to minimize the real conflict, the class conflict. And third, women's rights and gender equality are figured uh, as the peak of neoliberal individualism. For these reasons, family and not an individual is central for anti-gender discourses. Um, Antonich also claims that genderism, and he uses actually that word, is an ideology and not a theory because it excludes the possibility of different opinion. Genderism, he says, can no longer be the subject of peaceful academic debate, even in experts' journals, because a different opinion is immediately ostracized, denigrated, and demonized. These masters of discourse, says Antonich, uh, in the name of protect uh, protecting uh, uh, the and endangered minority and struggle against intolerance actually fail to tolerate any hypothesis, research, or scientific result that might bring gender orthodoxy to question, thus growing into a specific ministry of truth. This insight is followed by a long footnote in which the author claims that it is not even possible to publish an article in scientific academic journal if it is not in line with specific understanding of, for example, homosexuality, that is his uh, uh, example. Therefore, the results and findings in articles published in academic journals must be in line with gender ideology, which does not allow acad academic or, or any other freedom. Beside the point that the author does not give the examples of this gender terror, it is indicative that he finds that it is important to emphasize how gender ideology is ideology and not theory or science by reminding the readers how some, how some philosophers deliberately submitted a bogus genderist papers in academic journals and some of them were published. And the practice of bogus papers is not new, we can trace it to the 18th century, but the example Antonich used in his paper is very interesting. It is the paper entitled The Conceptual Penis as a Social Construct, con uh, construct uh, written by philosophers Paul Bogosian and James Lindsay, published in 2017 in the journal Cogent Social Sciences. The authors tried to show the suspicious credibility of peer review system in a field such as gender studies. However, if Antonich engaged with the article and the journal in question, and he didn't, he could see that we, uh, that we have here par excellence paid to publish journal. It, publish, it publishes almost every imaginable topics in social, social sciences, and it is not even a gender studies journal. Moreover, Bogosian and Lindsay first tried to publish the article in Norma, International Journal for Masculinity, uh, uh, for Masculinity Studies, a gender studies journal, which rejected the paper. However, Antonich does not want to explore this case. The idea is to show how gender ideology works, and it must work as ministry of truth, not as a theory. It is an ideology which does not allow different opinions and hypotheses, and as such, it is a basis for adoption of legal norms with no support by the population. I also wanted to say something about um, um, the um, role of um, editor-in-chief, Uro Shuvakovic, and his paper in um, uh, this article, um, but I will have to, you know, cut it a little bit um, down. But I want actually to put something uh, here on the table, if I have only a couple of minutes, is the role of um, editors-in-chief in journals and their responsibilities. Um, I think that is one more dimension of power, uh, abuse of power in the case of this topic of the issue in the Journal Sociological Review, because one of the contributors is journal's editor-in-chief. And according to the document on publication policy of the journal, and I will quote it, 
The editorial board is responsible for deciding which articles submitted to the journal will be published on the proposal of editor in chief. In case of thematic issues of the journal, when the editor of the thematic issue is appointed, so guest editor, the editor in chief will propose works for publishing to the editorial office after receiving the proposal from the editor of the thematic issue. Members of the editorial board, including the edit editor in chief, must hold no conflict of interest with regard uh, to the articles they consider for publication, and editor-in-chief keeps discretionary a right to evaluate the received manuscripts and not to put them into the procedure if he, uh, if he establishes that they do not fulfill standard content and formal criteria. And at the end, editor-in-chief appoints reviewers guided by their scientific competence and trying to choose those with the most competence specifically uh, necessary for reviewing a paper dealing with a specific subject. So we have that editor-in-chief here is in double position. He's the editor-in-chief who has so much power in the journal, and at, at the same time, he's the author of one of uh, uh, most prob problematic um, uh, 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 paper. So of course, this topic of, of, uh, of the issue has been criticized from different actors. We have reaction for sociological community. Um, we also have the reaction from association that is now uh, uh, from Belgrade. Um, and I will now have to, um, and I think that we have a very, very uh, complex situation regarding uh, um, reaction from feminist and also LGBT uh, um, uh, communities. Um, but what is for me here actually um, uh, important at the end is that we have a continuous accusations against so-called gender ideology as unscientific and biased. On the other hand, we have academic journal, which is categorized by the Ministry of Science of, Republic, uh, of, of the Republic of Serbia as an international journal. You cannot you know, have higher category than that. Where in the topic of the issue, editor-in-chief publishes his own article. The article was submitted, and that, that is the most interesting uh, thing for me, submitted on September 23rd, 2021, and accepted for publishing in five days. After we assume quite quick double peer review process, then exchange between the guest editor and the editor-in-chief, and final decision uh, uh, of the editorial board, and we can see that on the very first page of Shvakovic's paper, that the, the paper was submitted on September 23rd and was accepted on September 28th. The editor-in-chief proposes the paper for publishing after receiving the proposal from the guest editor. In public discussions, nobody actually mentioned this fact. We can all see, as I said, on the first page of Shvakovic's paper. So the whole procedure regarding the paper written and submitted by the editor-in-chief seems suspicious at the level of highest right ranking academic journal and its procedures, in addition to unsupported claims of the article itself. So questions I'm asking myself as a feminist theorist and as, a, as an editor in chief of the academic journal dealing with feminist theory genera, and as a professor at the Faculty of Political Science are, how do we as gender theorists react to this kind of so-called arguments and research published in academic periodicals volumes and books? Should we engage with anti-gender theorists as we are equals? So then we will have what Antonich calls exchange of different opinions. Are we in a danger to make the concept of women's and LGBT plus rights a matter of taking one side while the other side is equally valid and relevant? And finally, it's not a question, but my impression after reading reactions both from academia that criticize anti-gender discourses and LGBT social initiatives, it seems to me that we don't actually talk to each other enough and that we do not exchange ideas. So counterattacks against anti-gender initiatives seem quite often isolated and sometimes, sometimes they do not take all the facts into consideration to make our, strong, uh, our case stronger. And that is happening in times when we need to make a joint effort in order to protect human and women's rights and also important results of our academic research. And that's all. And I'm very sorry because I took so much time. 
Thank you, Katarina. Thank all three of you. Um, and this was this was really great. I mean, in terms of what we uh, got as some kind of knowledge package today, but also in terms of this kind of what Katarina said at the very end that we do in isolation both research and some kind of activism because very often we are at the same time activists and researchers and I think that this is one step towards uh, the idea that we should do things together if for no other reason ah, that that's this uh, legendary uh, first stage first stage yeah well what I wanted to say before I, I give words to to you uh, is that we really do have many uh, points in common. I think they are quite obvious, even though Katarina in the end focused mostly on, on, the, on the academic or conservative, conservative intelligentsia, which I think is most pertinent because really anti-gender discourses in Serbia have sprung from that quarter and then also spreads in, in all others like political parties that we have in, in Bulgaria and also this kind of new civic society, which is only on the rise here, as it's the case in North Macedonia. So I just wanted to uh, share with you what were my points uh, that I collected during this talk as, as points of, of convergence between our three countries. We did not talk much about Orthodox Church, but I really think that we didn't because as Gergana said, a lot has been said about that and we somehow see it as something which is assumed, but maybe we should also, also share notes on, on the influence of um, Orthodox churches in our countries, especially, for example, because the last, the last important steps that took place in Serbia around the um, textbooks that Katarina mentioned were also there because of uh, induced, so to say, by the words of Patriarch of Serbian Orthodox Church. So what we also share is our very uh, pronounced stance on the rotten or liberal West, and we appear as some kind of good part of the, the world uh, in, in contrast and in opposition to this rottenness there. Then uh, I would say that we all share distrust towards institutions, and that uh, I would like to somehow also emphasize that with relation to what Irena said, that this is in a way what is happening, this anti-gender mobilizations, that they represent some kind of anti-institutional actions, also very much resounding with what Girgana said about anti-gender, anti-measures, anti-West, so somehow all coming together. Um, the cultural factors, seem very important. And I would also like us to link them to social or rather economic factors, which we did not mention that much, but as we saw, uh, the other side is ready to mention them and to think, think about capitalism and trans-capitalist uh, influences on us. We should also bear them in mind when we uh, formulate our own ideas. Uh, I very much like this uh, because we don't talk about it enough that sex and sexuality are taboo topics, which Gergana pointed out, and I think we should somehow bring that to bear for, for all of us here. Um, what I also found very interesting is that, as Gergana said, the first mobilization started in 2017. As you could see with Katarina's presentation, the same thing happened in Serbia. But then there was another mobilization in 2020, which then again uh, links us to Northern Macedonia and how that was happening. So we have 17 and 20 as two years, which are important for our countries. Then also the question of natural family and the speak of neoliberalist individualism, uh, which somehow resounds in all our contexts. I will stop here. I see that we have something in the chat. Uh, I would ask you to raise your hands, or um, if, if you don't want to, I can also, uh -huh, I can also, um, if there's are questions, but as Ivan Trampic uh, raised his hand, uh, please even uh, join us. Koala, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm really happy and thank you for, for the presentations. I rarely get to, to, to discuss uh, this topic with uh, colleagues from the region because I'm doing a PhD comparing anti-gender movements in Serbia, Bulgaria, and Croatia. 
And actually, I'm, I'm going next week to Sofia to do interviews with anti-gender leaders. <laughs> so uh, for now, I have four acceptances. So hopefully I can work from there. Um, and uh, my, my question was about the uh, beginning of the mobilization in Bulgaria. Because, OK, on, on the level of uh, on the street level, let's say uh, protest. Uh, it is definitely uh, 2017 and the Istanbul Convention was the big case. But what I found, I wanted to also share with you, uh, these groups have been active uh, for quite a longer time. This is from the Internet Web Archive. Uh, so they were sending petitions already for the Child Act in 2012. Um, and if you, I mean, now, okay, you cannot go through all of this now, but check it out. I think it's going to be very useful as well, because already in 2012 here, we can find, for example, the American Alliance Defense um, Fund, or I don't know if they changed their name, but basically a lot of international and transnational actors. Yeah, Alliance Defense Fund, uh, Civic Initiative Justice, Society and Values Association. So all of these Bulgarian anti-gender actors that later mobilized, uh, they, that were more present when the political parties took up their issue uh, in 2017 and 2018, uh, they have been active for a longer time with probably, you know, very unsuccessful petitions. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it's it's worthwhile checking out. Um, I have a lot of comments, but since we don't have a lot of time, maybe that's it from me. Thank you once again. Thank you very much for this information. I was not aware, but uh, probably th that's the case. And um, yeah, I, I will check this out. It will be great to meet you in Sofia. <laughs> you are always welcome to write and we can arrange this. It's a very interesting topic of dissertation. So I'll be glad to have a look. <laughs> and help if I can. Thank you, Ivan. We have uh, two comments, very pertinent ones, about how the Orthodox influences travel uh, across the border and that it definitely does. So um, Emir Pashanovic says, we don't read this journals in Bosnia necessarily, but boy, do the Orthodox churches work overtime here as well. Uh, well, definitely, yes. And then also there is Edita's um, comments on Poland and on Graf and Korolchuk's work, which we all follow very, very patiently uh, in all parts, I would say, of the world, not just here in the Balkans because what, what Poland set an, as an example, both in terms of anti-gender movement, but also how feminists, activists and researchers responded to that is, is, a, is a bright light. Uh, but I see Sonia Locker raising her hand, please. Thank you very much for the floor and thank you for very insightful and very interesting presentations. I wanted to um, uh, say something uh, which I think is uh, typical for all anti-gender movements. Uh, and it's different from what we have seen in the past. Uh, as we remember, the women's movement uh, was um, in the past always coming from the bottom up, pressurizing over political, democratic, uh, liberal, uh, left political parties and uh, fighting with uh, going through the institutions. What we have now uh, with this anti-gender movement is uh, in fact the uh, repetition of this strategy, but from the conservative side. And th this is something which is new. They are uh, really fighting for the souls uh, of the people through this populist narrative and, and, and uh, trying to, um, to bring to the people the idea that uh, ordinary people know better and uh, they are selling uh, prejudices and stereotypes uh, very um, carefully and uh, in a very outspoken way, leaning upon churches, leaning upon conservative uh, NGOs, uh, connecting with international uh, factors at this, on the same uh, page. This is new. 
we didn't uh, see something that uh, like this uh, before the crisis of 200 of 2008. Uh, and uh, I think that we do not understand very well how this anti-gender is connected uh, to the wave of uh, losing economic power and equality of the people in the society. So we have a discussion about conservative values instead of having a discussion of, about economic disaster, which uh, hit uh, women everywhere, especially in the new um, uh, members of the European Union, but also in others, uh, other countries too. Uh, so this is what I would like to, to have more uh, analyzed and approached. Uh, and um, uh, last, uh, but, uh, but not least, uh, if we uh, look into the anti-gender strategy of Orban, uh, you will immediately uh, see uh, why it is so effective because he combines this strategy with economic uh, incentives uh, he gives uh, to the most, um, I wouldn't say the most uh, affected uh, and poorest women in the society, but to those who can uh, and have still an economic role in the society. This is what he is doing. And uh, I think that uh, the answer which will not go into the economic reasons for this uh, anti-gender uh, offensive will not be uh, effective. Here, uh, I stop. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, yeah, I think we all agree with that. Uh, I just want to say that, again, Poland is the country which um, can serve us better than Hungary for, for this uh, economic incentive model because Hungary is uh, rather incentivizing the upper strata of, of uh, society than the lower strata, which also says something about how, how conservative strategies can, um, can survive even in the uh, non-welfare state countries or uh, this kind of special post-socialist capitalist countries. Uh, but if uh, any other one uh, out of our speakers want to comment on this or or maybe on something else uh, that we have in in the in the chat, please do. I would just say that the the uh, the work done by Graf and Korolchuk are really good in understanding what Sonia Lokar is saying. I totally agree that this is really important. And um, uh, I, if anyone wants to further learn about this I totally uh, I don't know this is something that was for me the best way it, it was the best uh, explained why this is uh, why is this uh, reality that we are living uh, now but I must say uh, while doing the research I read a lot of um, a lot of big uh, books uh, related to populism uh, etc and the gender aspect just to see. so i what is missing in the contemporary literature focused on populism is the uh, the gender aspect we need we need to to use these gender lenses in order to understand why this is happening with the anti-gender movement but also to understand why this is happening to the to democracy so for this reason I, again i uh, recommend graph and Slavcha dimitrov raised his hand yeah, uh, hi to all and incredible presentations and very exciting uh, talks and um, I especially enjoyed uh, <laughs> the presentation of uh, Katarina in the end, especially the that marvelous megalomanic uh, uh, quote of uh, such uh, enormous uh, proportions. And yeah, but uh, anyhow, uh, apropos that, and apropos the, this latest comments that that uh, Sonia and Irena also made, and it was shared with the Polish research in in the chat here. Uh, I think that that is that is one of the crucial strategies, and I think we will be doing nothing unless we think about uh, mobilizing a left feminist populist uh, perspective on these issues, first of all, and second, uh, addressing specifically 
uh, and turning back as an argument, uh, the neoliberal capitalist arguments involved in this in this problematic. So what Shuvakovich was arguing, okay, let's think about what's happening here. Uh, queer theory and feminist queer, especially socialist and, and uh, Marxist feminists, but also uh, left and uh, Marxist queer theories have also addressed the problem of neoliberalization of identity and blah, blah, blah through sexuality. So let's think also about those issues, not just uh, a priori dismiss them, but 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 think also how they obstruct, how they halt our efforts for uh, social struggle and social uh, justice, and what we can we can do with with these uh, problems as well. And especially, for example, how uh, on the very contrary, their arguments are involved in the neoliberal logic itself. For example, the argument of the importance of personal opinion and everything. For example, when De Brown does an extraordinary critique through how these arguments are involved in the neoliberalist logic, especially personal opinion and, and making personal decisions through private and corporate interests, et cetera, et cetera. So it is, it is also important, I think, for us to engage specifically with, this, with these arguments and turn them back upside down in order to, I don't know, deconstruct their, their logic, but still not just to end up uh, ourselves in, uh, uh, the, I don't know, liberal defenses, et cetera, et cetera. So, which I think most of us share, of course, here, but just uh, bringing it forward. Thank you all. Thank you, Slavica. Sonia, uh, do you also maybe want to say something because the hand is raised? Uh, if not, I would no, like... No, 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 I'm sorry, I forgot to put no, it It's down. okay, it's perfectly okay. Uh, I would like to, in fact, one more time give a chance to Irena, who was the fastest, and I'm grateful for that, Irena, but you, um, in fact, ran through uh, the part in pres of your presentation, which I found very important, where you were saying that there was a, the division between queer and feminist groups, um, which was made and deepened, the, which was in fact deepened by this anti-gender movements, uh, which I find very interesting and important, especially in this international group in which we are, since in the Yugoslav space, uh, anti, sorry, uh, feminist and uh, LGBT or queer movements uh, were for, for decades one thing, or they grew somehow organically together, and I think that's a very important uh, thing to be emphasized. Whereas today we 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 see, and I would not I would say that North Macedonia is not the uh, only country where we see that tendency that there is a gap widening between these two. So can you maybe go through that part of your presentation, which you kind of ran through? Tell us more about that, if for no other reason to warn us about what might happen elsewhere as well. Okay, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Adriana. I was uh, yeah, I was rushing, but to be honest, what why we were interested really in this topic to research it. <clears throat> besides, as I said, because some of the uh, legal initiatives taken by the anti-gender movement were supported and still are supported by some part of the women's movement, we were actually really afraid not to uh, not to have this kind of discord as you in Serbia have. It's a smaller country, and we believe that we could control this. So uh, what we did is first that, uh, as I said, we selected like five features, five discursive characteristics on how they, uh, this is how the anti-gender groups are talking to women organizations. In some of their articles, they're talking to feminists and women organizations, as I said, Portraying saying that them to them that women in penises or trans women is something that uh, women should be afraid, and I stopped there. But uh, there are also other tactics. So the other one is to portray trans women that as uh, women that uh, as someone that are someone who is winning women. They will uh, cite or share. <clears throat> Some beauty pageants, some, I don't know, cover of Mary Claire magazine or some sport events where trans women are winning. Uh, and that uh, they will show, this is very interesting, to show faces of sport and beauty pageants that were actually mostly critiqued by feminists on excluding or exploiting women, showing that they're 
actually losing their traditional uh, merits and uh, status. But what we find out through this research is that the anti-gender actors are not really interested in real inclusion of women as much as they care about creating this false perception that women are excluded at the expense of trans women. So the victims of this loss are the real women and the fake ones are to blame. So it's the trans women, the LGBTIQ activists, etc. And through such power relations, according to which trans women are more privileged than cisgender women, anti-gender movements actually advocate on their own definition of uh, feminism. Uh, according to which mobilization and activism to improve the rights and status of transgender people, especially transgender women, is um, impossible. They are very vocal on 8th of March, and th this is the reason why I don't uh, use the term anti-feminist. I use the anti-gender groups. It's because they're, uh, they talk about their own definition of feminism, not against feminism. And on 8th of March, they really remind us who, who are the people that belong uh, this uh, this holiday, this uh, event, and they advocate for the real feminism for real women. And they're very focused on uh, defining real women, or but through this strategy of delineating the renegades among women. So the anti-gender movements advocate really a fairly rigid and very fixed framework of what they perceive as real women. And any woman that does not fit into that mold should be either excluded, like trans women, or converted, like sex workers. So they're in Macedonia, they're very active around 17th of December, that is the International Day uh, for Fighting Against Violence Against Sex Workers. Uh, at the end, how they are deepening the division, uh, first of all, a lot of issue uh, is connected with money. A lot of arguments are that LGBTIQ organizations are citing the funds for women organization. Uh, and the second argument is who is taking care of women? All that feminists and queer activists are taking care of is um, um, women with penises. They don't even use trans women. So more or less, I wanted to keep short because I see we are 10 minutes long. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, mean, I think that this was really important. And uh, as we have entered into the time which was not supposed to be taken from you and your day of this Friday, I suggest we finish here. Although I can imagine that we could debate for, for hours about that, but this is just the first step and I could hope we will continue with, with this. Uh, I will um, use the opportunity just to tell you that as I said at the very beginning of, of my introduction, that we had two different strands uh, where this one was this kind of um, special one uh, and there is another one which is a classical one the classical dealing with representation we are that is uh, again Paul SE uh, network are going to have a, a, a webinar on March the 9th uh, which is going to deal with gender quotas changing the face of politics in Albania Croatia and Serbia achievements and limitations where our speakers are going to be Liliana Cicicaric uh, Maria Tashinko, Marcela Dauti, and uh, Melissa Antic Gaber is going to be our discuss discussant. Uh, so please uh, join us, and you can also follow us on our social media. Uh, and uh, I, I'm always quite bad with this kind of advertisement part of the of the uh, of the networking, but I think that we did a very nice very nice job today uh, at this webinar. Thank you very much for being with us uh, until 15 to 2 and hope to see you again uh, on the March the 9th or any other occasion that there is going to be plenty of them. Thank you very much, Adriana, for gathering us and uh, for moderating this discussion. It was a pleasure to take part. Thank you, Adriana, and also to Katerina and Gergana. Thank you all and see you soon. Yeah, you. let's keep in touch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ciao, bye.
Então... É.